Hello everybody, welcome to the show. My name is Damien Swaby, I'm the host of the Filmmakers Podcast, a podcast for filmmakers. And I've started this podcast for filmmakers to come on, talk about themselves, tell the world what they're doing, and hopefully it will be interesting for all of you. And of course it's called the Filmmakers Podcast, but you don't have to be a filmmaker to listen. You can be anybody, you can be a plumber, a doctor, you can be a, you know, a teacher, but what we're looking for here is to expand knowledge, share progress and hope everybody can learn from each other on this podcast. That's the main reason why I've started this podcast. And the first person um, I'm going to interview for the first ever episode is Raymond Hamilton. And he's put together a project that I think um, socially and creatively is just absolutely brilliant. So here's the interview. Raymond, how are you doing today? I'm good. Good. How are you doing? (laughs) Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Um, I'm actually... Over the moon, and I, and I'll tell you why, because I've just um, watched the whole. Okay. And I'm not just saying this. Obviously, I watched loads of films, and I talked to quite a few filmmakers. But what you've produced there, I thought was absolutely ready to go straight onto HBO, um, Fox, or any of those networks. It was really, really good, and um. I'm, you know, I'm not, as I said, I'm not just saying that. I, I mean, I actually, I, I don't want to give away any spoilers for everyone who hasn't seen it. But whoever hasn't seen it, I suggest you go straight to his website, to Raymond's website, and you check out um, the, the pilot. Because, you know, I don't clinch very, I don't really get, I'm not, I don't mind seeing blood or or things like that. But what we, what we saw in that, you know, really, really hit me in my heart. You know, it, it, and I've never actually thought about solitary confinement i mean you know i'm babbling on but what can you tell us how it came about your show and and who was behind it and um, how, and it, how it was shot so well and everything mm-hmm. um yeah you know um I, I just um you know a couple of years ago it was very much like you you know i never really gave much thought to solitary confinement uh, i never really gave much thought to the system of prison you know i just kind of assumed that Everything was what I, you know, saw on television or in the news, um, and I, you know, I couldn't be more wrong. You know, my 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 original thoughts of solitary confinement was this, like, you know, deep dark place underground, and um, it's quite the opposite, you know. Um, but the the origins of the show really came about. Um, oh, here I should preface this with with the listeners and, and viewers here. Um, the, my company, Think 10 Media Group, uh, what we do, uh, in this, the central focus of our, our company is to shed light on social issues, to humanize those that, um, unfortunately are not being humanized in our society. So that's, that's the goal in general of our company. Um, now this was back, uh, a couple of years ago in 2013 and, um, just, you know, listening to, um, the radio driving to and from, uh, you know, whatever, you know, jobs I was doing. Um, and, uh, there was these reports on, uh, the, the Pelican Bay hunger strike. Now the Pelican Bay prison is up North, uh, about five to six hours from where I'm based here in Los Angeles. Um, and at first, you know, um, the story was, you know, it wasn't that big. It was, you know, a few, uh, of those that were in solitary confinement were uh, basically refusing to eat. Wow. Um, and they, they had, um, you know, collaborated together. Um, it was very interesting because there's actually a small group of people that were very much, um, not in the same boat. You know, for example, um, you had a guy who was with, um, one of the, um, you know, I, I don't use the term gang, but like one of the black gangs, you know, not gang gang, but you know, yeah. in prison, you had someone with the Aryan nation, someone with the Hispanic. Um, and these are groups that are completely at odds with each other in the prison system. And, um, uh, the... <clears throat> These guys came together uh, because they just wanted the, the conditions in solitary confinement to change. So they weren't coming together to end solitary confinement, which which that you know that obviously needs to end, and we can get into why. Um, but at that point, they were just you know we want to just change the conditions. So um, as the days and weeks started to go on, more and more uh, the people that were incarcerated started to join this movement, um, and then you know turned into like you know twenty people to 100 people, to 1,000 people. Next thing you know, it's like 20,000 people. Next thing you know, you have those that are in in isolation in different states, you know, not just California. So it started to turn into this really big thing. And um, so, of course, you know, I'm just following this, you know, and it got me really thinking, you know, 
Um, but the biggest thing, you know, it wasn't so much the, the volume of people that were partaking in this. Uh, for me, it was one guy who, once this became a bigger story, they actually had one guy on the show who had been in Pelican Bay and had been in isolation, and he just talked about the actual um, experiences that he had. He talked about the conditions. Because the problem with what was happening prior to that is you hear all these people that are that are um, taking part in this movement, but you weren't, you know, to change the conditions, but you weren't being told what the conditions were, you know? Okay. So this guy actually, you know, got on the air and, and just, you know, literally broke it down, you know, and explained it. And it was just like horrible, you know, um, the, you know, the, the manner in which you can get into solitary, you know, you, you can get in there. Um, they have this thing called reckless eyeballing. This is, this is no okay. joke. So if, if a guard feels that you're recklessly eyeballing, you know, looking at them in a, in a, in a reckless manner or whatever, you can get sent to isolation. Um, if you have, <clears throat> let's say, you have a poster of, uh, of Malcolm X or even Martin Luther King on your wall. A guard can say, you know, that you, you, you might be promoting, um, you know, a, a racial divide in the prisons, you know, and you might be starting a racial riot. So they send you to the hole. I mean, all the, the list goes on and on. So you basically, know, if, if the guy, a prison uh, warden doesn't like you, he can just use that to send you into solitary confinement. Not in the warden, I'm talking about just the correctional officers, not the warden. Oh. A warden doesn't have to even get involved, you know. The off, you know, so this is just the officer. It's at the officer's discretion. You know, there's no jury. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> hey, you know, I feel you need to be there because of this violation in the whatever rule book, and then you're there. And then once you're there, it's insanely easy to keep you there. You know, um, so you know. Long story short, um, it was just it was an eye opener. You know, and it was clearly a, a severe injustice. Um, and, you know, to be filmmakers that, yeah. um, that want to shed light on social issues, we're kind of being untrue to our mission by not making a project on this. You know, so this is what I say, um, one of the first projects that I've ever done that was, um, you know, I didn't sit down and think about, okay, what is my next project going to be? This project came to me and said, Ramon, you need to make a project on this because people do not know what is going on. So that's how it came about. Now, in terms of the, the team, you know, and, and I think why you got such a strong reaction. And at first when you said over the moon, you know, because I'm not, I'm not uh, from the UK. I wasn't sure. Is it is oh, a good thing or a bad thing? Of course. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, All right. So I'm glad yeah. it was a good thing. Um, so... When we decided to do this, first we wanted to make a film, because that's what we've done. We've done films. Um, but as we started doing all the research and going down the uh, proverbial rabbit hole, there was just so much information to uncover, because solitary opened up the world to looking at prison in general, which then opened up our eyes to the systems of mass incarceration, which then opened up our eyes to the system of criminal justice and how, you know, how whacked out the criminal justice system is here. Um, that, that results in a nation, you know, we, we incarcerate more people than any other nation on the face of the planet, you know? So it makes you, you know, start to question and, and you realize like people need to be aware of this, not just in the US, globally people need to be aware of this. Um, so, so once we started to realize all this stuff, we're like, okay, there's no way we can make a film. This isn't gonna fit into a two or three hour film. So we realized that we have to do something that's, uh, you know, a series that can allow us to, you know, throw in all these things over time and build it up and, and whatnot. Um, so that's why we call it, you know, the whole, H-O-L-E, but on the, in our graphic art, there's a little W in front because it's the whole, it's the yeah. larger system, it's prison, it's mass incarceration, it's, it's the criminal justice. Um, now, in terms of the, the approach, um, we knew very, very early on that we wanted to cast someone who had at least um, experienced prison. That was, that was the main thing we knew. Um, now, unfortunately, there was only two arts groups in, um, in the California region, or at least in our region, that actually worked with those that were incarcerated to do theater and acting and things like that. Okay. Um, so um, one group called Poetic Justice, which is um, in the central coast of California, um, talked to the woman that runs it, a woman named Deborah Tabola, and um, she, you know, I told her, here's what we're doing. I, you know, I told her, here's the character description, blah, blah, blah. She immediately said, William Brown. So, I mean, she didn't even give it a thought. She was just like, William Brown. I was like, okay, you know, tell me about William. She's like, you know, she met him, um, you know, I think it was... Uh, I forget the exact prison it was in, but she met him while she was doing some theater program in prison. Um, he had done a couple of shows by then, um, and she was like, you know, he's amazing. He's just absolutely amazing. He's absolutely natural. I was like, okay. Um, now, Will had, uh, had already been released from prison, so now he was doing shows um, on the outside, but still working with her. So we connected, um, and, 
you know, it was the most unusual audition because typically, you know, when a filmmaker auditions people, um, you know, you have, you know, dozens if not hundreds of people, especially in Los Angeles where there's so many, you know, people that want to yeah. act. Um, so, you know, they come in, they read their scene for two, three minutes, and then next person, and you go on and on. Well, Will and I, first, Will was the only one person that I auditioned. Uh, and for two, we spent about an hour in that audition. So, and I'd say about 45 minutes of that hour was just spent us talking. Just, you know, like, talk to me about you, you know, tell them about myself, you know, and, and why I get into this type of work and blah, blah, blah. Come to find out through our conversation, he actually spent uh, approximately 18 months in the hole, in isolation himself. 18 so months. this is a man who, 18 months, 18 months. Um, and, and I'll get some more crew members in a sec. Um, so, so he, he already, he, he had that reality. He knew it, you know, he didn't have to try to imagine what it would be like. So anyways, we did some scenes and he was just amazing. He really was. Um, now the, the only concern I had is he had never done, um, film or anything on camera. Everything he'd done had been, you know, theater and theater is such a different form of acting. Yes. You know, you're much bigger. You have to, the, the people 40 rows back have to be able to see your emotion of sadness. But in, in video or filming video, the camera's right in your face. You don't have to be big. You have to just be it, live it, you know? Um, and so he was able to make that transition immediately. It was, it was insane. Um, so, you know, I think when people are seeing that, that reality and why it really hits them and, and that, and, and, you know, you're connecting to this person is because he's literally reliving it. You know, I don't even, I'm not, a, he's not performing. He's really not. Okay. He is reliving it. Um, you know, 80% of the, the, the series of the pilot was scripted. Okay. And 20% of it was just, we just improv, you know, there was a whole moment actually, um, you know, there, there's a, at the beginning of the pilot, so this isn't a spoiler, but at the very beginning of the pilot, you know, you, you see this man exploding, you know, he's yelling, he's screaming, he's banging, um, he's obviously trying to get someone's attention, um, and there's a moment towards the uh, end of the pilot where you see the, this buildup of him build up to that rage, to that, you yeah, know, yeah. and that was, that was no script, that was just, we said, Will, put yourself back in isolation, just show us what, you know, show us isolation. And, and camera guy, okay, just roll camera and just follow him around. And we did that for quite a bit, you know, and, and we got some lot of really intense things, but, but that was just him reliving it. There was nothing in the script, you know, and some of those moments were honestly better than anything in the script. So, um, so we, you know, and then another thing is our co-producer, a guy named Five Moa Limak, who, who co-produced the pilot with us, he actually spent over five years in isolation. So um, our, one of our grips, our key grip, he spent over six months in isolation, you know? Gosh. So we directly collaborated with people. In fact, our key grip was just by accident. We just happened yeah. to hire someone who came through referral. And then next thing you know, we find out like, wow, you were, you've been, you know, in prison, you've been in isolation, you know? So, so, but long story short, we, we, we collaborated with those that were close to the issue. You know, in, in all yeah. aspects, and getting the story down and getting the performances down. And then even just on set, you know, just getting the little nuances of how things would be, how, you know, the, the guards would bring food, how they would, you know, it's, it's, it's meant to be a, a, you know, true isolation, you know, so that, you know, there's no interaction between you and I, you know. And so guards are very much, you know, either they're antagonistic okay. or they just ignore you completely as if you don't even exist, you know. Um so I think all of that, I think I know all of those elements are what really caused it to be authentic um, and to really give a good glimpse uh, of what isolation is. You know, isolation, that's, yes, we're dealing with the U.S., but isolation is isolation. I mean, you, you do that in any country, anywhere in the world, and that's, you know, th these people are going to have those same physio physiological and psychological effects. It's torture, plain and simple. It's, it's, just, it's just torture. Um, so... So that was it. I mean, you know, I think we, we, we made it authentic. And, you know, the other thing I started to realize is that, you know, I looked at so many documentaries and read so much literature. Um, but the problem with, um, you know, with the prison system is that they allow cameras in on their terms, you know. Okay. So you can never really get a real look at isolation. They're not going to ever, you know, say, hey, yeah, come on in and roll some cameras in an isolation yeah. cell. It's not going to happen. <laughs> it's so really, the, the, the only way to authentically do it is the way that we did, you know. Be honest with, with the material um, and work with those that have actually experienced it. Let them guide you, not the other way around. Um, and that's where we get something authentic, you know. So, so now, um, you know, we're going to be filming episode two. 
uh, in just in July, in a couple months. Right. Uh, so, you know, I'm really excited because that's going to, um, we're going to continue with, with the, the character of Marcus, who's our main character in the first episode. Um, and, but we're going to introduce some other characters and we're going to start to open up the world a little bit. We're going to see a little bit more of prison and start to discuss these issues of mass incarceration, you know, that can in turn, you know, here's a perfect example of how everything's connected. There was a 15-year-old kid, and, and I forget his name right now, but anyone can Google, Google this and you'll, and you'll find the story. Uh, this was in New York. He was accused, accused, not, not convicted, accused of stealing a backpack, a backpack. Think about that. And <clears throat> so he was arrested, and while he was awaiting trial, they sent him to um, the Rikers Island, which is a jail in, in, in New York, which is um, – and basically the, the, the boy, the child, a 15-year-old kid – he ended up spending over three years in, in that jail and spent over two years of that time in isolation. So here you have, you know, and this is, this is because of our system of mass incarceration. You know, it is completely unjust. You have a child who's awaiting trial, awaiting, and has pled his innocence the whole time, you know, and we send him to this all-male jail. I mean, he's, he's there with adults, you know what I mean? Grown men. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, they, they'll get put him in isolation to protect him for his safety, oh. you know? But then when he's in isolation, you're put... Sorry about that. We suffered a slight technical problem. Nonetheless, we're back. So, the the kid in jail mm. with men, you, you were saying? Yeah, where did, we, where did you lose me? Um, you, you said he was a grown child... Well, sorry, a child in prison with grown men, and then I lost you. Yeah, he pled so his he, innocence. He, yes, he pled his innocence, um, and uh, you know, ended up spending the um, you know three years in that jail and over two years of that in, in isolation. Um, and I would imagine that you know the the correctional officers or the guards, you know, they probably put him in isolation for his protection, you know. Um, but the problem is when you're putting him in, in, in isolation, or at least what isolation looks like in our in our country. You're, you're putting, you're subjecting him to torture now, you know? Yeah. So, like, a rock in a hard place. Do you yeah, leave completely. him out here with these grown men, or do you put him in, in something that we know is torture? <laughs> you know, like, the UN has straight up said anything more than 15 days in isolation is torture, period. He spent over two years, you know? So, the, you know, he's just one story out of millions, you know? It's, it's, it is insane. There's approximately 2.2 million people in our prison system right now. 2.2 million, you know, um, and it's estimated that 80,000 uh, people on average are in, so in isolation. Uh, but there's a lot of social uh, justice groups that argue that number is, is much, much higher. So um, this is the stuff that people don't know. This is the stuff that I didn't know. You know, if it weren't for those those men and women that, that involved in that hunger strike, I wouldn't be here today, you know, or, yeah. you know, it was, it was them that stepped up that sacrificed themselves, um, that got their story out there to, a, and then a filmmaker like myself caught wind of the story, you know, did some more research, dived in and realized this is a serious injustice that's going on in this country. Um, so my goal is to, to share that voice to, to the world, you know, and for us to, um, to just understand the realities and hopefully, you know, try to find ways to get engaged, you know, at the very minimum, you know, sign petitions, things like that. But, but it has to stop. It really does. It's a great goal. And, I, you know, I always like filmmakers that have something to say. Me and my friend always go on about that. I'm always knocking heads saying, it's great when filmmakers have something to say and something's made passionately and it's for a reason. Um, and one of the things I also like about your film is, I thought the easy way that a lot of people do that when they tackle some subjects is to go and do it in a kind of guerrilla style of filmmaking, a lot of handheld and, and things like that. Uh, but yours, didn't you didn't approach that. I mean, it looks and felt very much like I'm watching a movie, a full on polished film, but you're still able to capture the rawness of that situation. And I thought that was, that was really impressive. I mean, how many members of crew did you have to do that? We had, um, it was, it was a small skeleton crew, um, but we had some very, you know, professional and seasoned people. Um, yeah. we had, uh, probably on any given day, about five to seven crew members. Okay. Um, and, um, our cinematographer, I mean, he's been in, in the business for quite a while. Um, he, you know, he actually worked on the pilot episode for free, you know, oh, he nice. was that, he did. 
He um, he brought his camera. We actually shot on the the Canon C three hundred, which is nice. a, a fantastic camera. It is um, neat. And um, and so you know he he brought you know he, you know the, the visuals that that's him. You know he, yeah. he did an amazing job. Um, you know we talked about the the feel that we wanted, uh, yeah. but he really was the one that brought that feel to life. Um, so it was it was a small crew, but you know um, everyone took it very seriously, and everyone wanted every aspect to be as best as possible. Um, our sound recordist, um, he was amazing. Not only was he, you know, capturing great sound on set, but he would, you know, he actually on some downtime, you know, on his own time, he just went around the jail, recorded, you know, sounds of footsteps of keys clanking against the the, uh, the night stick, um, the atmos, against the bars, you know, random sounds, you know, that we then ended up incorporating into the final sound design. So it was these little things, you know, um, that just, you know, just really again, you know, just made it authentic, you know, and made it. Um, you know, everyone was committed to, to that, to that authenticity, you know, and, and doing the, the best we, way we can. So, um, so, you know, kudos to, to the team, kudos to, to Will and to Colin who played our guard. Yeah. The guard, um, he was the uh, evil. Oh, he, so yeah. He, he pulled it off. And the funny thing is he's the sweetest man I've ever met. He is, <laughs> he is, he is not that guard in real life. You know, oh. People, you know, have watched the show and they're like, Oh, I hate that guy, you know, bloody yada yada. Hmm. Um, but let me say publicly he is not that guy he is he, not that guy. he's, he's a just a brilliant brilliant actor then because he's he, a very brilliant actor he's yes. so convincing i just oh you know you want to just smack you him. want to spin to him <laughs> yeah you want him to go into solitary yeah, um, yeah yeah so he so, sold it well and there's going to be some twists and turns with his characters too you know so in episode two so um you know what you see isn't what you get so one of the other things that I really appreciated uh, what you did in that film was the incorporation of the music. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I almost thought um, in that part, <laughs> silly of me, I thought they brought a, a, a piano in for him uh, to play. <laughs> but so who, whose idea was it to, um, to incorporate that style of music? Was that a real life situation that happened to uh, someone in, in Solitary before? Well, um, yes and no. Um, is that exact one? I mean, I, well, I can't even say no. So I could say yes and maybe is my response. So um, when you're in isolation and you and you have nothing, you know what I mean. Your your mind wanders. You you find ways to be, you know, to to fill your time. So yeah. you know the uh, someone doing this imaginary piano is completely realistic. You know. Um, now, whether or not there's someone who actually did that, I don't know. That's the maybe part, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I'm sure that people have done something comparable. That I'm absolutely positive. Um, in terms of the, the specific music, uh, my co-producer, her name's Jennifer Fisher. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, not producer. She, she was the producer. Um, she's also my wife <laughs> and, and producing partner for the company. Um, she's actually a pianist and. Um, when we were when we were looking at like the second or third draft of the script, um, one of the things that we wanted to do was to show him doing something to try to to try to ease himself, to try to find some sort of peace. Um, and there's 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 a lot more to the story in terms of where that music is coming from. I'm not I can't give that away, but but the music is going to be a very big part of, of this character as we move forward. Um, but basically, it was her idea. You know, she was like, you know, I thought it would it would be great because um, we also too we needed like during some of the montage scenes we needed music. So we, yeah. you know, she was like, well, why don't we just have it organically come from him as opposed to scoring? Score. Yeah, yeah. You know, so um, so so that's it. You know, and if you well, I don't want to give anything away, but yeah, but that's essentially where that came from, and it was it was a really brilliant choice. You know, quite a few people, you know, including yourself, have commented on that. So um, kudos to her. She, it, was a, it, was a, it was a great call, and it worked out really well. It certainly did. And so let us know before we wrap up, where can we find more of your work and uh, you on Instagram and Twitter and any of those things that the listeners know? Yep. So um, the, the, if you want to see some of the work, the, the best place to go is Think10 Media Group, and that's T-E-N, spelled out T-E-N, so think10mediagroup.com. Uh, you can go on there. There's the, the access to the whole if you want to watch the pilot episode, which I encourage people to do. Um, it's, it's, it's free online. Watch it. Share it. Um, there's also uh, some links to our other films and things like that. Um, you know, if you want to stay up to date, I'm, I'm constantly, um, you know, the best place to follow me is definitely Twitter. That's where I'm at. I'm, you know, the, the tweets are mine. I'm, I'm, you know, basically updating as I move forward with this whole project. So um, they can find me at uh, Ramon 
which is R A M O N underscore Hamilton. Uh, that's that's my Twitter handle. So at Ramon R A M O N underscore Hamilton. Um, that's that's definitely the best way to keep up to with uh, what's what's going on. So um, yeah, you know. So please engage, and um, this is just the start. It's just the start. You know, we've got quite a, a road ahead of us. Um, I'm excited for episode two. We've been doing some consulting. Uh, with some people, uh, got a few more consultations to make, and then it's time to pack up the script. <laughs> so, excellent. And one thing I'll say um, before I wrap up as well: uh, future episodes, people, I would recommend is what I'm going to do is donate and leave a tip. You know, no amount is too small; every little bit helps. We all need that Correct. as filmmakers, and this is one project I certainly believe is well worth donating. If you've got anything you can donate, so. Um, Thank you. Raymond, brilliant. Great talking with you. And hopefully you'll come back on the show for us. We really appreciate if you could do that in the future. Absolutely. Anytime. Brilliant. We'll speak soon. Take care. Bye.